Hey, 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 it's Rebecca, and you're listening to Resilient by Design. Today, I'm going to talk about sourcing and some do's and don'ts of sourcing for clients. I'm sharing with you what I do to keep my sourcing endeavors more efficient. I talk about the types of vendors that you want to work with and really just how to maximize your profitability. So I hope this episode is for you. I know a lot of designers have been asking me to talk about sourcing and where I source. This item is hopefully going to be helpful for a lot of you just starting out, but even if you've been doing this a while, because we can always find ways to fine tune and improve how we source our goods and products. Goods and products are the same thing. Huh. Goods and materials. There you go. (laughs) All right, guys, I hope you enjoy this episode. All right. (laughs) I'm Rebecca Hay, and I've built a successful interior design business by trial and error, podcasts, online courses, and so many freaking books. Over the last decade, I've grown from an insecure student to having false starts to careers, and now I'm finally in the place where I want to be. Throughout my journey, it's been pretty obvious that I'm passionate about business and helping other entrepreneurs do the same. Each week, I'll share tangible takeaways from my own experience and the experiences of other badass women to help you build your confidence and change your business. You guys know there is nothing I love better than staying in my all-day PJs all day. (laughs) Abode has launched my new favorite set of buttery soft pajamas that come in three fabulous colors, snow, camel, and my personal fave that's on the thumbnail for this podcast, Midnight. I feel so put together, whether I'm recording a podcast like this, meeting a client on Zoom, or tucking myself into bed with the kids at story time. And as you all know, I'm a pretty big fan of the classics when it comes to design. And that translates to literally everything I purchase for my own home decor and my clients. And of course, my fashion. Abode also has the perfect, luxurious, 100% cotton, timeless bedding. It pairs perfectly with my chic all-day PJs. You gotta invest in your rest. Check them out at lovemyabode.com and type in Resilient10 for $10 off your very first order. Treat yourself to the perfect pair of luxurious all-day PJs and soft cloud bed linens. Okay, sourcing. Sourcing, (laughs) sourcing, sourcing. These are the things we spend the most time doing. Sourcing. It's honestly, I have to say, sourcing, I've said it like five times, is probably the best and worst part of our job because it's the part that got me the most excited when I first started in the design world. I was like, oh my God, this is so fun. I get to shop with someone else's money. What? Like, how is it that I get paid to do this incredible thing? But then as time goes on, and those of you who've been in business for a long time can relate, sometimes it starts to feel like a bit of a pain. A pain because, oh, I still have to get out of the house. I still need to go and look at the product or I need to search online or, oh, every time I source something, it's not in stock, or I find out it's backordered. It starts to become a little bit more time-consuming and a little less exciting. So today I want to walk you through the do's and don'ts of sourcing product, materials, for uh, goods, for your clients. I want to share with you some really useful takeaways, and especially I think this will be helpful for anyone who's newer in the industry, anyone who's a student. But even if you've been doing this a really long time, you might find something in my do's and don'ts that could be an interesting aha or a takeaway, and there's always room for improvement. So as you listen, think about if this works for you, because Like I say always with my courses, it's not one size fits all. We are all unique. And yes, we need to have systems and ways of doing things. This is what has worked for me. And to be honest, I've changed how I've done things over the years. I have different vendors over the years. But what I'm going to share with you today, it's about, I think it's about five or six key points with the do's and the don'ts of sourcing that I think will be really valuable and helpful Uh, to help you be more efficient and help you feel more confident in the vendors that you're working with and the choices that you're making. So 
without further ado, dun, dun, dun. Okay, the first um, tip I want to share is establish a list of go-to vendors. Why? When you have a list of go-to vendors, that is suppliers that you work with on a regular basis over and over again, they will have your back. I can't tell you how many times there's been a mistake made by my team that the vendor has taken care of for me because they know we are such good repeat customers. There's so much value in that loyalty. When you show a vendor loyalty, if it's the right vendor who has integrity, they have your back. I recently had a situation with one of our carpet vendors who I've been working with for a very long time. And the carpet, we did a, a cut broad loom with a, uh, what was it, like a two and a half inch, um, is it called a tape or a banding? I call it both. I don't know. <laughs> yes, I'm admitting it to the whole world. I feel like I'm going to call it a banding. Taping? Doesn't matter. It was a cotton you know, border. And it came to the house and the clients weren't there. And it was it was actually not supposed to come yet. We were supposed to hold off and bring it for a reveal. And it came. And my designer, who was in charge of the project, called me and was like, ah, Rebecca, like, I don't know, like the rug came. First of all, I was like, why is the rug there? It's not supposed to be delivered yet. They, just because they're installing the carpet runner on the stairs and the broad loom in the basement does not mean they can deliver the area rugs because that is not our process. We hold off delivering the area rugs for when the furniture's there. But actually, in this case, it was a blessing in disguise because I went to site to see the rug because my designer was concerned that it was too white and it wasn't working and that the client's not going to be happy because they'd already made a comment about how white the walls are. Well, first takeaway from that is never project your own insecurities onto what your clients may or may not be thinking, right? Because sometimes they might have a passing comment. It doesn't mean that they are questioning everything, um, but there was something off. So I went to site and I was like, okay, well, let's see. I mean, this is a rug actually that the client had picked. It wasn't even our original choice. It was what they wanted. And we got there and I was like, OMG, the, it's the taping. It's the border. It's, it's like the wrong color. It's making the carpet look more white because that tape, that cotton binding around the edge of it is um, like really pinky. Like, is that what we picked? That was our mistake. And so we called our vendor and we're like, listen, can you meet us here? You've got to look at this. Like, it's just showing up really pink. And like, I don't know, is there another one we can do? Anyhow, long story short, our vendor gave us a price to replace that binding on the carpet and I was like, well, I guess I have to eat it because it's our mistake and I can't put this in front of my client because it doesn't look like we know what we're doing. To which he then said, listen, I will pay for it. You've brought me so much business over the years. I value you as a client. I will take care of this for you. That is why you have repeat vendors. You have a go-to list of people that you work with. Now, how do you find them? It takes time. But once you start to find someone good, don't have wandering eye like and continually try new source, new, new source, new source. Nobody is perfect. But when you have a relationship with a vendor, continue to give them business. So establish a list of those go-to vendors. Not only will they have your back in times of trouble, but you will really know their product and their service offering inside and out. You will know the limitations of what they can do. You will know that this product is true to color or that this fabric or that this is really great. Like you start to really become knowledgeable on their product and you can stand behind it when you present it to your client. Also, this helps and we'll, this kind of ties into what I'm going to talk about a little bit later about efficiency, but it helps with keeping your sourcing fast. It makes sourcing faster and easier because you go straight to those vendors first before you start to look elsewhere. So that's the very first do, which is establish a list of go-to vendors. It will take time, but literally, and I, I mean it, like I mean actually create a list. I don't just mean like, yeah, yeah, I have go-to vendors in my head and we know where to go. No, you need a list because then when you start to hire someone, and I've experienced this, and you don't say, here's where we start. If you want to source rugs, furniture, lighting, go here first. They'll just start going anywhere and everywhere where they think. They'll be online. They'll spend hours online sourcing. And then you'll say, well, did you go to 
gym at like carpet zero. I made that up, by the way. Um, and they're like, oh, no, who's that? And you're like, oh, my God. So I just paid you all that time to source when I really wanted you to go here and I didn't tell you. So have it on paper, have it in your Google Drive, type it up, and it, it will change and ebb and flow over the years, but have a list of go-to vendors. Okay, next. Determine what profit margin you want and select your vendors to align with this. This is not something I ever thought about. I was so concerned about making the design beautiful and perfect, I spent zero time worried about my profitability. I mean, this really will bring us back to our conversation um, about discounts. And if you didn't catch my most recent episode with Steve Ryan, I think it's episode 99 of the podcast. Go back and listen to it because he has some really great verbiage around um why you should not share your discounts. And if you've been listening to this podcast long enough, you'll know that I feel very strongly about this as well. You are leaving money on the table. It's hard to be profitable if you don't maximize your opportunity to make money. And it is not you being greedy. This is just a business model. You should not share your discounts, in my opinion, um, because that is an opportunity for you to actually gain profit and the money that you that you collect for your time covers all your expenses. So determine, though, what that profit margin is going to look like. If you're listening to this and you give away all your discounts and you give everything to your clients at cost, well, then your margin is 0%. So it really doesn't matter where you shop or what the discounts are um, because you're not making money on it anyways. Don't recommend that. <laughs> But if you want, let's say, a 25% margin, that's going to mean that you're probably going to have a mix of custom and retail. Some custom vendors, you can mark their product up 20 to 40%, and I know some designers that do more. Uh, a lot of retail, you're not getting any discount, maybe 10 15%, max 20%. So they probably would even out to about 25%. If you really are looking to up that profit margin and you want more like 30%, then you really need to be strategic about where you are getting your products from and who can give you the best discounts and deals. And there is nothing wrong with you designing a home and picking the brass faucet that works as equally as the as the second brass faucet, but the one you pick, you make more money on. You are not doing your client a disservice. If anything, you're doing them a service because if you stand to make a little bit more money, you will be happier. You'll be better equipped to service your client. You will have the resources to take care of any issues. This is why you need to really pay attention to your profit margin. So, and that's going to lead us into custom versus in-store retail shopping. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But until you understand that there is a profit to be made from reselling your goods, sourcing is not going to be as much a priority for you in the sense of you're not going to pay any attention. When you Once you have that go-to list of vendors, and ideally those vendors will give you the best profit margin. And if you don't know what I'm talking about and you use a program like Design Docs or QuickBooks, go back and look at your last year and pull out a report that shows you margin by goods or margin by vendor. And you will quickly see where you are making the most money. Is it custom millwork? Is it fabric? Is it window treatments? Is it tile? What is it? Where are you making the most money? Not only does this help inform you on the type of projects you likely want to do, but it will also help you understand where you should be sourcing and spending your time picking products from. And I think the challenge sometimes for designers is that we're like, oh, we just want to be so creative and so different. But it is a fine balance, I believe, in being creative, but also considering that you are running a business. Gone are the days where I would just buy this a beautiful light fixture, let's say, because I knew the client had to have it if I know I'm not making any margin on it. It just doesn't make business sense. That project will come and go, sure, I'll have pretty photos for it. The client will never value the fact that that was the far superior light fixture and that you didn't make any money on it. And, and you're hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars less profitable than you could have been. This is how I see it. I think you can still make it a beautiful design. And I think in some ways, if you push yourself to be really creative and work with custom vendors, you can make more money and have a much more unique one-of-a-kind design. 
So let's talk about that because that is a really hot topic, I feel. Um, Custom versus retail. Everybody wants to know. That sounds wonderful. Custom sounds wonderful. Where do I find these people? So let's start with the pros and cons first. So here are the pros and cons to custom made goods. So whether it's furniture, rugs, anything really, lighting, tables, furniture, custom, the pros, custom is unique and one of a kind. Hands down, if it's truly custom, you can customize it to be um, a certain seat depth, a certain back height. You can do a certain size or shape rug. You can have a very detailed, beautiful custom made piece of furniture with interesting curvatures and caning and shape and size. And the world is really your oyster. You can go as crazy as you want, or you can just have something custom made that looks like something you'd buy in a store. That's up to you, but it can be unique and one of a kind. Also, another pro of custom is that it will elevate your brand. When you start to design spaces that have more custom pieces of furniture, people will start to notice. They'll ask you, where did you make that? Or sorry, where did you where did you buy that? I get this all the time on Instagram, like all, all, all the time, because so much of what we do is custom. People will say, oh, I really love that chest of drawers. Where can I buy it? And to which I have to say, oh, unfortunately, you can't buy it. I mean, we had this, we designed this and had it custom made here in Toronto. But when people start to see that, that starts to elevate the level that you are seen at as far as a designer. Um, Also, you have a little bit more control when something's custom, especially now more than ever. With the world being crazy and back orders and out of stock and discontinued and stuck in the middle of the ocean on a container, all that jazz, you have a lot more control because you know where it's being made and the timelines can be relatively concrete. And that's what I really like about custom. Also, the quality is often much higher than something that you, a case good that you would buy uh, at a retail store or, or wholesale even. You can make more money. You can make more money because they give you a trade price. There is no retail equivalent. So you can mark it up 20, 30, 40% without any backlash because your client can't compare it. They can't shop you. It is one of a kind. So those are some of the pros of having custom furniture made or carpets or lighting. Um, Some of the cons are (laughs) the big one. It's hard to find or it can be harder to find good suppliers and vendors. It can be hard to find people that make that custom piece of furniture that you want. But what I can tell you after seeing the community that is so forthcoming and sharing inside our designer meetup Facebook group. All you need to do is ask and like a handful of designers will immediately tell you where to go. Um, Say, hey, I'm in Miami, who can recommend? Or hey, I'm in Toronto, who can recommend? There's so much power in just asking and people are sharing. It's a very different industry now than it used to be. It used to be very much that people coveted their their vendors and their sources. And probably there's still a lot of people that are like that. But I think with the advent of social media and people's ability to tag vendors and just want to share and share the love and then the vendors being on social media and tagging the designers, there's so much that can be found out there. Just go to Instagram and you will find, start asking in your stories, start searching in the search bar. You can find custom vendors for whatever it is that you want relatively quickly. Um, The other con is that it could be more costly. So yes, having a custom sofa could be more costly than going and buying it at Crate and Barrel. Although nowadays, I can tell you it's sometimes the same price or cheaper. It's often, in the case of a sofa, it's often the fabric that will make the difference. So if you're ordering, you know, um, your customer's own material, COM or COM, um, fabric for a custom-made sofa, that fabric cost can vary, as you know. It could be, I don't know, $20, and it could be $600 a yard. And so that's where you can really kind of control the cost, Um, but it's also another, sorry, another con would be that it is harder to sell to your clients. And I actually think this is a bit of a myth, myth, misnomer, myth, (laughs) because I think if you position it properly to your client and you explain why the value is there, it could be that we can get it in a shorter turnaround time than ordering from 
I don't know, South Hill home. It could be that we can customize it and use a special fabric. Maybe it's six inches shorter than what's on the market. Maybe they really want something super unique. There are lots of ways to position it. Maybe it's Canadian made. And so it's more sustainable. It's used with, they use Canadian lumber and like soy foam and you can control the construction of it. Um, But I do think that clients that are hiring a designer are probably looking for something that's elevated. And part of this comes with like time in the industry, positioning and branding. But sometimes people fear that if you can't sit in it or touch it and feel it, it's harder to sell. So that comes down to who your ideal client is. I'm not going to go into that right now. But yes, if you have a client that needs to go to Crate and Barrel and sit in that chair to know if they like it, then maybe custom's not for them. But don't forget, nowadays, how many retailers actually have all of their products in their showrooms? A lot of us are really ordering things, taking a leap of faith. Okay, so custom versus in-store pros and cons. Um, I think that it's important to have a balance of those and start to build a little bit at a time. If you've never done anything custom, Find a vendor, try one piece here and there to see how you like it, to see what the experience is like and start to build that relationship. Okay, my next point is all about how to source effectively and efficiently. So this might, I'm going to share with you how I do it and why. Some of you may completely disagree and this may not work for you and that is fine, but I think there might be somebody out there who's been trying it another way and it's not working for them. And maybe when they hear this, it will help them. So I like to source by project. I do not like to try and tackle all of my projects in one vendor. It goes kind of contrary to the idea of like a, like, um, uh, what's it called? Like if it like, um, it's not economy of scale, but where if you're going to a lighting vendor in person, why not like check off all three projects that you've got going on, right? You're already at the store, one project, the next project, the next project. The reason I don't like doing it that way, um, because I I did tr- used to try and do that because I was like, this makes sense for efficiency, is that as a creative mind, I've always struggled with jumping from project to project mentally. So yes, I'm sourcing lighting um, and I know and I know my projects inside and out, but I would get this like shiny penny syndrome. And I'd be walking to the lighting store looking for, okay, I need to get the table lamps, um, you know, for the nightstands. And then that room also, but I'd be looking and then I would look, I'm like, oh, but that, oh, look at that. That sparkly chandelier could work for project B. And it would take me so long in that vendor and it would cause me anxiety. I would feel stressed out because I would be in my head constantly like, did I get, did I find everything I needed? And so I do not like jumping from project to project within one vendor visit doesn't work for me. Some of you might love it. It doesn't work for me. I mean, some ways to help this could be being more organized and having a list. But even with a list, I can tell you it was like squirrel over there, squirrel over there. So I would recommend that you, here's a, here's a don't, don't shop without a list. Do list everything that you are looking for before you get to the vendor. Instead of one morning being like, huh, I feel like I'm going to go shopping for lighting today. And you go to the store and it's really enjoyable and you're wandering around and you see things. Then you get home and you're looking at your pictures and you're putting, and you're like, oh my God, I completely forgot that I needed a flush mount for that hallway. Oh, I guess now I'll just go look online. It's not as efficient. So make sure you're prepared when you do go sourcing it, you have a list. So what I like to do is pick a day and shop for one project at a time. So one project in a day, so or half a day, or whatever it is. And the reason I like to do that, and it may not sound efficient to everyone else, but that's the way my mind works. I want to be in a project, all in, like whole hog, and just be living and breathing it. So I bring everything I need, whether it's floor plans, mood boards that I have with me on an iPad or printed, and I go... And I plan to hit the lighting store. Then I'm going to go to the furniture place around the corner. Then I'm going to go to Kravit to start some initial fabric sourcing. Then I'm going to go to the tile store down the road. And yes, I try to plan my route. So I'm not driving to Timbuktu and back in a day. But I try to keep it because 
it's so fresh, right? So I'm at the fabric store and I'm picking, or like I'm at Kravit, let's say, and I'm pulling fabrics. I'm like, oh, look at this Tebow. It's so beautiful. Oh, this would be so nice on a sofa. Then I go to, maybe I go to like a custom uh, manufacturer and I'm like, oh my God, that chair with this fabric, that would be amazing. Oh, now I just need some lights. It's like in a day I can pull so much design together if I am truly focused in one person's house, in one project, in one space. That is how I work. That might be useful for anyone who's listening, but that's how I like to source. So an extension of that is my next point which is also what I like to do. So take it with a grain of salt if you're not into this, but I like to go in person first before I go online. I get inspired when I'm in a physical store. I like to get inspired by potentially new fabric that's come out, or I walk through and I see a design style I hadn't seen before. I like to go to my go-to vendors, get a, maybe touch and feel a new finish, get a sense of what's out there, before I go online. Then back at the studio, the team will source online with or without me. And you can quickly pull things and maybe you're like, oh yeah, I saw that in person, or this is the direction I definitely want to go. And I took a picture of a light like this. And we do a lot of our sourcing online and we go to our go-to vendors first. And if we can't find what we want there, then we look further afield. I do not dizzy myself with a million options. When I have a clear vision of my, in my head of what I want this room to look like and I've already been inspired, now I'm going to start searching for those things. And once I found something that's perfect, stop looking. You're going to make yourself crazy. No client wants to spend money on the hours for you exhausting every option in the city. Find the right thing that works and be happy with that. But if you can't find it, keep looking. So then I'll go back to vendors if I need to see something specific, right? So this is where I highly recommend you use your reps, your representatives that you have at different vendors, and you will get them if you don't have them yet. You'll eventually be assigned somebody, even if it's Crate and Barrel or a local furniture shop, you will have a go-to person. Use that go-to person. They are there to make your job easier. <clears throat> this is something I was always too afraid to do at the beginning. I would try to do everything by myself and I wouldn't rely on them as help. And I like to see them as an extension of my team. Now, obviously some vendors are better at this than others and you'll start to learn, but call your rep, call your Kravit rep and ask them to pull samples. Say, hey, I saw these, these memos online. Can you pull them? Do you guys have them in the showroom? Or, hey, do you mind cur courier, the courier, can you courier these samples to my office? Can you drop them off? Ask if they can help you before you offer to go do it yourself. You would be surprised how many people will go out of their way, how many reps will go out of their way to get you samples, to send you options. Say, hey, to your lighting rep. We're looking for, um, you know, a brass flush mount fixture for a hallway in and around $300. Can you send me some great options? You know my design style. They can save you time. And here's the thing. Most of them are more than willing to do it because they want the sale. They work on commission a lot of the time or they get commission in addition to their salary. So they want to make the sale. They want to help you. And also a lot of reps really enjoy the design process. So include them, make them an extension of your business, make them a partner. Then the next time you're about to have a presentation, you shoot, we forgot to get this thing. You can pick up the phone and they can be right there to help you. They can pull samples, send you options. Please lean on your reps. They are there to help you with the sourcing. Okay. My very last nugget of wisdom is that I recommend when you're sourcing, and it kind of goes back to your go-to vendors, but you have your go-to vendors list, but I really want you to consider when you're starting sourcing, start with the vendors you get the best pricing at. This is a business. Go there first. Don't waste your time going everywhere and then there. Go there first, and then you can look further afield. If you can't make money on the products you resell to your clients, you better, you better, better, better be charging a hell of a lot of money for your time. And you better not discount a single hour or give any time away for free. You need to make money. You can make beautiful spaces and still make money. Okay, that is all I have to say about that. 
there are so many opportunities to learn about specific vendors and um and suppliers in your own cities. I think the best place to do that though is locally. Go to our Facebook group, ask around on Instagram. I mean, I could share who I use, but I'm just in a little bubble in Toronto and I know so many of you are further afield. Um, but please share with each other, share who's good, who's not good, who has better customer service, who's faltering in customer service. We are a community here to support each other. Not one of us does the same design work as the other. We are all unique. We are not in competition. We all work differently with our clients. We have different personalities that attract our clients to us. And that is all I have to say about that. (laughs) Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Let me know in our Facebook group. Um, If there's anything that I've missed talking about here, please let me know and I'd be happy to touch on it. Have a really great day. I'll see you soon.